All right, Frack family, well, I'm going to read to you for the final time from the Gospel of John. Our text this morning is chapter 21, uh, verses 18 through the end. So listen as I read for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only... If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to those things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So read the words of the living God. So, as I alluded to, this is our final look at this Gospel of John. And it's been a, uh, it's been a wonderful book. I've heard from many people just how blessed they have been as we have studied this book together. Someone described it to me this week as uh, we're saying goodbye to a dear friend as we, as we leave John. Well, if you recall, uh, we are in the last chapter. We've already finished with the climax. The, the most significant storyline in the book is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we covered that. And, and as we discussed, John has already given us his purpose statement. He, he explained that he wrote this book so that people would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So chapter 21 is a postscript, if you will, talking about the reconciliation of Peter. It's kind of like, if you remember in The Lord of the Rings, uh, Aragorn is crowned king, and that is the culmination of pretty much everything that matters in the story. But there are still a few things that we need resolved. What happens to Sam and Frodo? And what happens back at the Shire? And if you've watched the extended movie version, you know that there's a lot of resolutions apparently in Peter Jackson's mind as it just seems like ending after ending after ending appears. Well, that's what's going on here. The, the big deal has happened, but there's still an important postscript for us. And so it's, it's Jesus and Peter. And last week we saw that Jesus called Peter to himself along with the other disciples and standing around a charcoal fire just like the setting where Peter had betrayed Jesus. Now Jesus asks him, do you love me, Peter? And three times Peter says, you know that I do. And three times Peter says, then show me your love, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. That third time when, when Jesus asks Peter, Peter, it says he was grieved. He was pained in his heart and his soul and in his inner man there was sorrow there because he knows as Jesus is asking him three times that this is in response to the threefold denial and as reflecting on that this week I realized Jesus was giving Peter here exactly what he needed think about it when you have wronged someone and when you've been caught in something that you shouldn't be doing what do you need First of all, you need to know that you are forgiven. That's what we long for. We're, we are ashamed. We feel guilty. And if we are guilty, we should feel guilty. And we need to know that the one we've offended forgives us. 
And ultimately, every sin is against God. So to have Jesus say to Peter, not so many, in so many words, he doesn't actually say the words, I forgive you, but in talking to him and, and entrusting his, his bride, if you will, to him and trusting his people to him, he's extending forgiveness. And, and Peter, no doubt, understood that. So he needed that acceptance. The other thing we need is the ability to do something right. And again, that's what Jesus gives Peter. Peter, do you love me? Then show me and go do what you need to be doing. Again, I was reflecting on this and, and realizing uh, there's not a lot of dialogue. This is not a long uh, discussion. There's not a lot of psychoanalysis going on here. Jesus knows exactly what Peter needs in order to get over this hump and, and, and be restored. I forgive you. I accept you. Now go do what's right. And I was thinking how often uh, we want to so badly calm our conscience when we've done something wrong. And these are the two things that will calm that conscience. Knowing that we're forgiven and then doing the right thing. Going and doing what God has called us to do. If Peter, think about if Peter had, had sat around reflecting too much on what he had done, this could have gone a very bad place. I mean, you can imagine maybe on one hand, Peter getting bitter at Jesus. You know, Jesus, you called me Satan. And if you hadn't called me Satan, I would have felt better about myself and I might not have betrayed you. <laughs> or he could have just grown self-conscious about everybody. I wonder what the other guys think. I wonder if they're going to respect me. I wonder if they're, they're going to kick me out of the club. I wonder if they're always going to hold this over my head. Jesus doesn't get into any of that. He simply says, if you love me, Peter, go do what I've called you to do. And I know as I re reflected on this, I thought that's, that's the way forward when we have done something wrong. We seek the forgiveness of our good and gracious Father and our good and gracious Lord and then go do what's right. That's what repentance is all about. If we don't get out of the chair and go do something that's good and right, then it's easy for the enemy to just wreak havoc in our hearts and minds, reminding us of our failures and our guilt. Go in the grace of God and do what he's called us to do. And that's what Jesus calls Peter to do. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. And I have to believe that in that moment, Peter was feeling some relief and probably elation and maybe even a little lighter until the next line. Jesus says, and he prefaces it with his, uh, his typical introduction to something that's very serious, truly, truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Kind of bittersweet. On the one hand, Peter is told, you're going to grow old. This was probably 30 or 35 years before Peter died. So he knew he had some time. And what Jesus is saying is, you know, as a young man, you wear what you want to wear. You do what you want to do. You have a lot of freedom. But the time is coming, Peter, down the road, when someone else is going to dress you and take you where they want you to go, and it's not a place you want to be. And with the phrase, you will stretch out your hands, as John tells us, this is signifying what kind of death Peter would die. And as church history tells us, if it's trustworthy, if we can, if we can trust the sources, in, uh, in Rome, in the mid to late 60s, under Nero, Peter was crucified for his faith. Uh, there's even another account that's, that claims that he was crucified upside down, that he had said, it's not, I'm not worthy to die the way my Lord was, and so he is asked to be turned upside down. 
we we can't verify that there's some uh there's some uncertainties about that but we do have pretty good evidence that he was crucified makes me wonder what were those 30 35 years like for peter do you want to know <laughs> do you want to know when your time is going to come do you want to know how it's going to come some of us probably think yes i'd like to know some of us no thanks i would rather it just take me by surprise so Peter here is given the freedom and the, the, the encouragement to go and take care of the people of Jesus, knowing he was going to pay the ultimate honor to Jesus in being crucified for him. And he did it. When we get into the book of Acts, we see a transformed Peter. He fed the flock of Jesus. He taught the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, he wrote a couple of epistles that, that are in our Bible, and you can just tell the love that he has for the people of Christ. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, I am a shepherd or an elder writing to other elders, and he commands elders to shepherd the sheep of God. As your fellow elder, he says, he did it. He spent the next three decades plus feeding the flock of Jesus until he went boldly in death for his Lord. And again, we see in the book of Acts, Peter becomes a very bold and brave man. And we've seen glimpses of that, of course. We saw it earlier in John's gospel. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've hit Peter pretty hard, uh, and Jesus does here as well with the uh, three questions. But it was only Peter, when the soldiers showed up in the garden, it was only Peter that whipped out his sword and started swinging. None of the other disciples stood up to this large group of soldiers that had come. So he had some boldness and courage. Now he would no longer turn his back on Jesus. In fact, he was one of those who was beaten in the book of Acts for his faith, and he counted it a joy that he would be worthy of suffering for the cause of Christ. And he was faithful to the end. And John here says, this is the kind of death by which he would glorify God. Which begs the question for all of us, by what kind of death will we glorify God? Now, Jesus has not told any of us this is when and how it's going to happen. We're, we're not looking forward to, we're not, we're not expecting a brutal execution like uh, Peter had. But we are to glorify Jesus in our life and in our death. And the call for all of us, the way we can all glorify Jesus by our death, is to remain faithful until the end. To love him and serve him and be willing if he should call us to it, to give our lives for him. Because that's what he did for us. There's something else that Jesus says twice here that grabs my attention. Twice Jesus says to Peter, follow me. That should bring back some memories for Peter and for us. That is exactly the phrase that, that Jesus used when he first called his disciples. Imagine what Peter was thinking on that first day when the Messiah shows up. John the Baptist had been talking about him. And Jesus walks up to these fishermen and says to Peter, follow me. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to take you on an adventure and I'm going to give you an assignment that will blow your mind. And Peter goes. And he would have never dreamed, probably, of watching this man turn water into wine, walking across water, healing a blind man, raising up a man who had been lame, raising up a man who had died. He would have never dreamed of that. Peter saw things that we can only dream about. Here, Jesus says to him, follow me. And what he means is, follow me to death. 
Be like I was, Peter. I fulfilled my calling. I did what my father asked all the way to the end. That's a phrase that John has used already in this gospel. Jesus loved them to the end. And he was faithful to his father to the end, to death. And now he says to Peter, you love me? Feed my sheep and then follow me to your own cross and give your life for me as I have given my life for you. And as much as I like to pick on Peter and point out some of his uh, impetuosity and such, he did it. The Holy Spirit changed him and he was faithful to the end. But Peter is Peter and he's like some of us. So as he's following Jesus, he looks and he sees John and he's got these words rolling around in his head that I'm going to be crucified in my old age. And he looks over at John and he says, what about him? What's going to happen to him? What's his lot? And Jesus says, basically, none of your business. Uh, I try not to overuse the Chronicles of Narnia as illustrations in my sermons, but it's hard because C.S. Lewis captured so many wonderful things about the character of Jesus. Uh, Aslan is, is just the best non-Jesus version of Jesus that there is. And one of the things that has always uh, impressed me is how in, in various occasions, in different stories, one of the children wants to know what's going to happen to another of the characters or another of the children. And I love how Lewis has Aslan say, Child, I only tell you your story. That's hard for us. We want to know what's going to happen to everybody else. God is not concerned to make sure that you know what's happening with somebody else. Your story with Jesus is your story with Jesus, and you're not to compare it. You're not to be concerned with anybody else. You just do what Christ has called you to do. And Jesus says to him, so what if I want him to live until I return? That's none of your business. You stick to your, your journey. Now, this is hard for us at another level. We have this view, at least implicitly it seems, that God should treat everybody the same way. Uh, this, of course, is a very controversial and hot topic in our culture right now. Equality. We hear about equality all over the place. And certainly the law gives us uh, equality of opportunity. We have the right, every, Christ, every American, rather, is supposed to have the right of, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But some take that to mean equal outcome, that the government should, re, should make sure that we all have exactly the same experience and nobody gets anything that somebody else didn't get. That's bad enough in politics, but that is a really awful and erroneous view of God. He never promises to treat any two people the same way. And we must be careful not to be envious, jealous, and either be upset with somebody or be upset with God when somebody else gets something that we don't. And this can go both ways. This can be, we can be jealous of good things that God gives to others, or we can be self-conscious when God is blessing us and he doesn't bless others the same way. And we can withhold gratitude to God because we feel bad because God's not blessing everybody the same. That is not a biblical approach to any of this. God has never treated people the same way. There was one, uh, one of, of Jesse's brothers who was chosen as king. Jesse had a lot of sons. I said that wrong. Jesse's sons. David had a lot of brothers. There were many of Jesse's sons who could have been chosen, and God said, nope, 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 nope. That's the one. 
and he raised David up to be the king of Israel. He didn't raise all the others to be the king of Israel. Abraham was the one man in Ur that God chose to be the father of nations and to be the, the head of the spiritual line of Jesus and the, and the biological line of Jesus. He didn't choose anybody else to be that. He chose Moses to be the leader. And on and on we go. Jesus himself chose these disciples, these apostles. He didn't choose other Jews of his day. And we must always be really careful not to think that God is obligated to treat any two people the same way. He's not, and he won't, and he doesn't. And we need to, to, to avoid being caught up in anybody else's story. God is asking of you things that he's not asking of me and vice versa. And he says, what is it to you, Doug, if I bless so-and-so in this way, or if I say this to so-and-so? You don't worry about them. You follow me. You go where I tell you to go. Now, I love this, I love this, little, uh, this little note here. And since uh, we believe that John is the one that's being described here, we can understand why John wanted some clarity. But it just shows, uh, well, the, the, what I'm talking about is the saying went out among the brethren that that disciple, meaning John, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Isn't that just how we are as humans? We are not always good at sticking to what is actually said. We, we extrapolate and we make assumptions and we draw conclusions that are not part of what was actually said. We don't hear very well. We don't stop and think. And that's apparently what happened. You can see how this would work. The other disciples hear this and they start assuming some things. And next thing you know, John's going to live until Jesus comes back. And one wonders, if, if you've read Thessalonians lately, both letters, Paul has to address the first century church, an error that is spreading, that Jesus has already come back. And John was probably alive at that time. And you just wonder if those are correlated. If, if somebody is saying that, uh, that well, I guess that wouldn't exactly fit. But there was, there was uh, this preoccupation of Jesus coming back in that first century. And that could be tied to a wrong view of this thing. And John wants us to understand, Jesus never said, I'm going to live until he comes back. He just made the statement, what's it to you if I want him to? And then John says, this, this, this is the disciple, talking about himself, who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And then here's the final sentence, final verse of John's gospel. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So we have John's gospel, and we have Matthew, and we have Mark, we have Luke, and they cover a lot of different events. And if you're familiar with those other three, you know that John is very different from those other three books. The, the three of those are fairly similar, John very different. But here John is telling us, even if you combine all four of those Gospels, they don't begin to scratch the surface of all that could have been written of Jesus. And of course, if you're like me, that immediately makes you think, why couldn't there have been more? I want more. I want to know what else he did. I've got questions that need answered. And I want to dive in. But none of the gospel writers were intending to give us a full biography of Christ. That's not the purpose. This is not an 800-page book. None of them are. Where we get all the details and, and all the background and this and that. That's not the point. These gospel writers are all writing for the same purpose, to persuade people that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Son of God, that he came to this earth and he died on the cross, though he was innocent of any wrongdoing, 
and that God raised him from the dead, that he is Lord, he is Savior, he is Messiah, he is our King. That's their purpose of writing. That's the point of these books. And so that's why John and the other writers chose what they did, so that we would have the information we need to decide if we're going to follow Christ. So that's how he ends the book. And in some ways, it reminds me of some of the things that he said way back at the beginning. If you recall, we had the, the prelude, the first 17 verses or 18 verses of chapter 1, where John began, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then a little further down, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Jesus is that word. He is God. He took on flesh, and he has revealed who the Father is. It's one of the reasons we love John so much, these kinds of phrases, these kinds of, of sentiments that's, that are expressed. Uh, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. Jesus said this himself repeatedly. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I have come to reveal the Father. I've come to show the Father. It's the, it's the Greek word that lies behind what we call exegesis, where you take out the Bible and you present it for people. You study it in detail. That's what Jesus did did to the Father. He didn't, he didn't study the Father. He, he's one with the Father, and he came to explain and show us who the Father is. And there's more that can be known, and thankfully we have the rest of the New Testament that we can dive into, and we can go back and read and reread and reread again the book of John. But it's my hope that all of us coming out of this study will do that, that we will read it over and over again, and we will behold the glory of the one and only Son of God, and that our faith will be strengthened, and that we will be convinced that he really is the Messiah, and that we will receive his grace and his truth. That's what he came to do. He is full of grace and truth. And that grace and truth spilled out of him and pours over all of us if we have trust in him. So it's my prayer that we will be like Peter, that when we have sinned, and we all know that we have, when we sin again, and we will, we will receive the grace and truth of Jesus and then follow him. Go serve him. Go do what you know he's called you to do. And sometimes it's going to be hard, he may call some of us to give our lives for him, meaning to die for him. He will certainly, indeed he has called all of us to give our lives for him in the sense of living every single day of our life devoted to him, serving him, honoring him, and worshiping him. So my prayer is that this study of the Gospel of John has enriched our faith, and given us a glimpse of who God is enough to propel us to, to serve him with our whole heart and to long for the day when we will see him face to face. John goes on to write that in his uh, letters later on. We don't know yet what we will be, but we know this. We will see him face to face. Lord, come, and may that be so. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, again, thank you for this book. Thank you for the word that you have left for us. Thank you for your spirit who illumines for us the truth. And now I ask that that spirit would fill everyone who is listening to my voice, that you would transform us 
into faithful servants who will follow you no matter what, even to the cross, if you would call us to that, that we too would be full of grace and truth and that we would live every moment longing to see your face. So Lord, you have promised that your word will not return to, your, return to you void. And so I'm asking, accomplish great work in us through our study of John. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen.